Hey there, art nerds. Today on Box and Swatch is a twofer. Today we are unboxing, mud testing, and field testing the Arteza Expert Brown Cotton Rag Watercolor Block. Whew, that is a mouthful. So this is supposed to be a 100% cotton rag watercolor block, and I'm looking forward to exploring it with you guys today. Well, hey there, art nerds. I've got another Arteza paper review for you guys. You guys know I love round watercolor blocks. We've talked about a few of them here on the channel. We've talked about Paul Rubens. We've talked about the Dora Art Cellulose Round. And we have talked about the Magnani 1404 Cotton Rag Watercolor Round. Today, we are talking about an Arteza Watercolor Round. So this is their expert line, which is 100% cotton. It is a cold press paper, mold made, so not handmade, acid free, which is an unusual inclusion when something is 100% cotton. Usually they don't have to mention that. This is usually mentioned with cellulose papers. It is a glue bound block. And they say it is ideal for watercolor techniques and mixed media. We receive 20 sheets in this block and it says, note, use a plastic palette or Arteza hobby knife to carefully remove each painting. And if you guys aren't sure how to do that, I will happily demonstrate that in today's review. They also have a couple of QR codes, one for a watercolor pad, help, helpful tips, and the other for 20 off if you join the Arteza Club. I do want to say that if you are looking for watercolor tutorials, I've got you guys more than covered. I've got some great playlists where even if you've never painted with watercolor before, I walk you through the entire playlist. I will link those down in the description and in the cards for you guys, and I really hope you'll check them out. I think I've got a little something for everybody here on the channel. It also says Arteza paper pads are available in a variety of types and sizes. Please visit Arteza.com for more info. I have reviewed a lot of Arteza products here on the channel, including other Arteza watercolor papers. And typically I find that their expert, their cotton rag line, it's okay, kind of overpriced for what it is, but it's okay. Their premium line, which is a cellulose watercolor paper though, I'm really not into it. I don't dig it. It's not really for me. So I'm hoping that I will really like this round watercolor block. I also want to point out, I have zero affiliation whatsoever with Arteza. We don't have any kind of deal together. All opinions are my own. And I purchased this block using funds generated from my Patreon. So this is as unbiased a review as I can give you guys. So what I'm hoping to do today is obviously we're going to quote unquote unbox it. And that basically means unwrap it take a look at it we are also going to throw a whole bunch of water at it to see how well the pad actually holds how much the paper buckles and kips and whether or not it stays secure in its block bound format and then i want to paint a watercolor illustration on this paper for you guys so just taking a cursory look i am seeing what might possibly cause a bit of resist when we add our water, but we'll talk about that in a bit. It has a nice light cold press texture to it. Nothing too pronounced. And it also doesn't have that terrible linen like texture that their premium paper has. So I'm really hoping that I am going to enjoy this round cotton rag Arteza expert block. And I look forward to sharing it with you guys today. So for the mud test, I'm using my Daily Driver watercolor palette. So these are the professional grade watercolors that I use all the time. I'm also using some of my favorite watercolor brushes. So the only thing that's different here is the Arteza watercolor paper. And I noticed that it's not as absorbent as I would like. I'm having some trouble with water control and the colors aren't really building up all that much. There's a scar on the paper and it's really visible when you add paint. There's some warping where the opening is, but it's otherwise holding tight nicely. Nicely. The colors diffuse out really prettily. And then as it dried, and I'll show you guys that in a moment with a hyperlapse section, it warped so badly that it ripped itself loose. I've had a lot of blocks catastrophically fail, but this was the first time a round block has failed that badly. So you guys will see that in a minute. The colors are really pretty on it though. So there we go. That is our damaged 
time for layer two, day two. I saturated it pretty well and that seemed to calm down the kipping. I did have to hold it down while I was painting though, not exactly something you wanna have to do with a block bound watercolor pad. It took the layer of water quite well with minimal reactivation and I was able to glaze a second layer of color on top of it. And that scar is still pretty noticeable. I think that's probably a factory defect, but that's something Arteza should be aware of and check for before they send these out to customers. And of course, this was purchased by me out of pocket using funds from my awesome patrons on Patreon. Thank you guys so much. So for day three, this seems to handle loads of color quite well, but we need to figure out some way to reinforce the block so that it holds tight. The whole point of a block bound watercolor pad is so that you don't have to stretch your watercolor paper and so that your watercolor paper isn't going to buckle and fold as you're painting. So it has been four days since we started this adventure together. This has three layers of paint on it, one each day and then allowed to dry completely and fully. So we had a major fail here on day one. We have some well, this is to be expected. This is actually the actual opening and it actually pulled away a little bit further. So you do want to be careful with this Arteza cotton rag pad because it's just not up to the challenge of all that water. But I do think it is up to the challenge of all that color and I think it did a pretty admirable job. So now we're going to use this palette knife, run it around the edges like that. Only had to go less than halfway to remove this one and our paper is now free. It did not soak in through the back, but, and I really, really slopped the paint on, it did soak in around the edges, so that's kind of to be expected. So next, we're going to do the field test with this round of Arteza cotton rag watercolor paper. So the mud test showed us that there are some definite pros and cons to this paper, but I still had fairly high hopes, especially with how it was able to handle that color. So I have a cute illustration of a starry witch that I wanna draw for you guys. I'm using Pentel's red lead for this and I am doing it in hyperlapse in super fast speed so that this doesn't take 5 million years, but I will share clips of this over on TikTok and in my YouTube shorts if you guys want to see it. Probably not actually slow down, but maybe I can find some way to really showcase it. The problem with drawing for you guys is that if it shows up well, I'm not going to be able to paint or marker on top of it. And if it shows up poorly, then it's going to be great to paint on top of. But I really enjoy using colored leads for my underdrawings because it means I don't have to erase the whole thing. And it also gives me a chance to kind of revise what I'm doing, as you guys can see here. The problem with this is that I have to sketch really lightly on this paper because I don't want to scar it. Cotton rag watercolor papers I have found tend to be a little bit more prone to scarring. And this paper doesn't seem like it has a whole lot of sizing to it so it does seem like it might be a more delicate paper to sketch or draw onto so normally what I would do is I would try to run it through my printer if it weren't a cotton rag watercolor round block um, but since it is all of those things I'm not going to run it through my printer this time I'm going to draw it which doesn't give me as many opportunities to revise it and clean it up as I might like but it does give me an opportunity to do start to finish and share the whole process with you guys which I find just really fulfilling and it's something I kind of want to do more of I've been working towards doing more of that and sharing as much of the process as possible with you guys uh, I can't do it for every tutorial because it just doesn't always work out but I do try to do it when I can because I think sharing the drawing process the revision process is fun and I think it's really cool to show you guys all the underdrawing and all of the like planning and constructive drawing that goes on to be able to draw something like this so if you like how I draw if you're interested in learning how to draw I've got some some great drawing tutorials here on the channel and I'm also working on some more since I'm teaching a volumetric drawing series and I think it'll really help you take your art to the next level especially if you're interested in drawing more from imagination and not having to rely super heavily on reference I've also got some great tutorials on how to draw people as well as some great tutorials on how
how to draw comics because in the end, at the end of the day, I am a watercolor comic artist. That's where my heart is. That's why I learned how to draw to begin with was for comics. And that's why I learned how to paint was for my comic seven inch Kara. So that's my heart, that's my baby. And that is the viewpoint that I'm coming to when I'm reviewing watercolor and art supplies. So if you are also interested in watercolor comics or interested in comics, I've got you covered. And you guys saw me referencing my hand just then. Normally something I would like to do if I wasn't drawing live for you guys would be to take a photo and use my phone as the reference so that I can get the hands just right. But I am using my phone for other things in this moment. So I had to do a little bit of live reference there. So once I've got the basic form sketched in, I can start refining some of the details. In those earlier sketching stages, I try to keep my sketching really light. Uh, it's just easier to erase when it's light like that. It's also easier to see the details that you're gonna draw in later if you have kind of different line weights that you're using, different amounts of pressure that you're using. So I am doodling with a Muji mechanical pencil using Pentel's 0.5 red lead, which is smaller than I normally like to work, but it does give me kind of a delicate line that works well with this. And I've been using this combo, the, the Muji pencil and the 0.5 red lead together for a really long time. So it just kind of works well for me. On the note of sketching, this paper is kind of pulpy. It doesn't take sketching with the red lead well. I had to be careful not to cut into the paper. And in a minute, I'm gonna ink on that and we're gonna be able to talk about it a little bit more, but I gotta finish sketching before we can get to inking. I'm doing kind of a combo today of colored line art and regular black and white line art. So I am doing the stars in pink and I'm going to ink our girl with brown and black just to kind of help push that lighting. And I mentioned, or I hinted at the fact that this paper doesn't really take inking super well either. The inking kind of spidered out, especially with softer brush pins. And while colors dried fairly vibrant, they also sometimes dry kind of dirty looking like the yellows that I'm also going to use for inking. So I am inking today, as I so often do, with the Tambo Furenosuke brush pen. Since this is a combo video, I am going to not only have a link where you can buy this watercolor block, if you are interested in it, down in the description below, but I'm also going to have the materials that I use linked in case you wanna get some cool art supplies and help support the channel at the same time. Man, this video is full of twofers. And since I've reviewed a lot of other round watercolor papers and blocks, I'm going to link some of those reviews for you guys if you're looking for some good alternatives to this paper or hey, it piqued your interest and you're curious about learning more. I'm also going to link some of my other Arteza paper reviews and maybe some of my other Arteza product reviews if you're curious about that. And I'm also going to link not ink, well I'm inking now, but I'm going to link some other watercolor tutorials in case you'd like to hang out with me a little bit more, maybe watch some more painting tutorials. I don't know if you are doing it for relaxation or if you're doing it because you love to watercolor or if you're doing it because you're interested in learning how to watercolor, but I think I've got a little something that's gonna suit everybody. So check the description below for all the good stuff. And one more plug, um, I have the line art for this available for my patrons if they want to color and paint along. It's just like a thank you for all the help and support that you guys have given me over the years. I try to share my line arts regularly over on Patreon. So if you're not a patron yet, you can join me at patreon.com slash natosoup. $2 a month will get you early access to videos. It'll get you access to my class materials, like my presentations and the materials that I make for my classes. And it'll also get you access to free 
printables like this one if you enjoy coloring for relaxation or you just want to relax and enjoy painting somebody else's work for once. I know that's a lot of fun. So you can find me at patreon.com slash soup. If you're one of my patrons and you feel like you missed this line art, make sure you double check. I may have shared the line art way before this video went live. So if you kind of just look through the archives, hopefully you'll be able to find it. I do link everything, every, everything that goes live once a week in my Patreon newsletter. So that could be a great way to track down stuff that you're like, hmm, I wonder if I missed that. In case it's not apparent, I like to point this out because I like to kind of demystify the art process and I feel like recording for art often confuses things more than it needs to. This video has been time-lapsed several times so that we can get it into a watchable form. Nobody draws that fast. Nobody inks that fast. I encourage you to take the time you need to make the kind of art you want to make. Social media puts a lot of pressure on us to update daily, which is not feasible, frankly, for most artists. Um, some artists can kind of figure out a way to do it. They either draw quickly enough or they've got a backlog of things or they, they figure it out and I, kudos to them. In my better moments, I'm able to do that myself, but I would love to help remove some of that daily update pressure that other artists might have. So we have our finished line art. I'm going to allow it to dry for 24 hours. Then I'm going to erase some of the extemporaneous red lines that I don't really need. And then we can get to our watercolor painting. We can get to the actual field test. Not that drawing and inking aren't field testing, but we can get to what you guys are here for, the watercolor field test. Now I have some really cute techniques that I use in this tutorial to create glow effects. And if you're interested in a tutorial that really just focuses on that, I've actually got you covered. I've got one coming up that is super simple and super basic to walk you through it. But the first thing I'm doing is I am establishing kind of some undercolors. So I'm establishing the glow of the stars using a cool yellow and then a warm yellow. I'm establishing sort of the impact that would have on the environment using a warm red that then transitions into a cooler red, almost a pink. And then I'm dabbing in some ultramarine blue as we start reaching into the shadow. Shadows. And while it's still wet, I'm going to dab in more of that color and allow it to diffuse. So this block does not hold the paper taut. Over the course of a couple of really wet layers, like these layers here, the paper broke free of the block. That is honestly a big blowout. That's a big problem for a block bound pad of watercolor paper and it should be able to hold tight through several really wet layers of water. You guys can see it start to buckle and kip. This is a problem because not only is the paper gonna dry wavy despite me using a block bound paper, which is typically more expensive, but it's also going to cause the pigments to shift in a way that I can't necessarily predict because it's broken free. So it does dry tight. So just be aware that while it's wet, it kind of has a mind of its own. And granulation on this paper, and I use several colors that should be granulating, granulation on this paper is muddy rather than striking. And I think it's due to the strange paper texture. Layering, particularly wet and wet, also seems like it's going to be a challenge because layers seem to lift right off the surface rather than mix and layer and optically create new colors. So that's another big womp womp for this pad of paper. Painting on this paper, it also seems like it's already so chewed up and pulpy. I didn't notice all these issues during the mud test because, you know, I don't know, but maybe it's my subject matter. I have a feeling I'm going to be using some masking fluid once I finish kind of establishing all these layers. I'm really trying to build up color depth similar to what I achieved in the mud test. In fact, the mud test and how this paper handled color in the mud test is what inspired the color palette for this, as well as how I'm handling the colors. I'm also including time lapse or hyperlapse portions of the paper drying so that you guys can see how the colors shift as well as how the paper changes as it dries. And from time to time, I'm going to get a little bit of my hair in the shot. I apologize for that. It's definitely kind of frustrating for me, but it's also kind of funny. A little bit of the hand of the artist. That's how you know it was Becca. Used to be my nose was always in the shot because I've got a really big nose. Now my hair is always in the shot. I just, I just can't win. 
So in these earlier stages, I'm really trying to build up color. I'm really trying to build up intensity because this is a technique that I've kind of flirted with in the past, like with that fireflies illustration that I did a while back and I'll link that for you guys. Um, and I felt like I'd kind of killed the piece in that instance, killed the magic and killed the fire that really made it work by painting too much on top of it and toning those under layers down. So for this illustration, I really wanted to allow those to shine through and to affect the finished art. And I think you guys can see, hopefully you guys can see just how to pulpy that paper texture is and this is coming from somebody who paints on like shizen i'm not unfamiliar or uncomfortable with pulpier papers but this is a weird one because it shouldn't be that pulpy i think it's a sizing issue now artiza doesn't actually make their own stuff they white label it from other companies so it might be the manufacturer they're white labeling from if any of you guys know who artiza is getting this paper from let me know i am super curious about that So I am applying some masking fluid now and generally papers that have sizing issues don't play well with masking fluid. So I feel like the masking fluid is probably not going to come back up without a fight, but it's still something that I want to test because it's something people commonly use and you need to know if masking fluid is going to eat up your paper. There's several papers that I've reviewed for you guys here on the channel that just get eaten up. Like Shizen is one of them by masking fluid. And those are papers that we just don't use with masking fluid. So I'm thinking that the pulpiness is a lack of sizing. So all of this is me setting myself up for a technique that I've done with you guys several times. So this isn't like a whole new technique, but it's a really fun technique with a lot of impact. That's fairly easy to do as long as you're kind of patient with it. And I am so sorry, my camera does not want to focus. I'm just applying masking fluid. So even though it's going to drive you crazy, just you can close your eyes. I'll tell you when you can look again. I apologize for that. So I'm trying to set myself up for a technique that I've done several times times it's a high impact kind of low effort technique that's a lot of fun and I feel like a cotton rag paper should be able to handle that so what we're going to do is we're going to really utilize layers and layers of masking fluid and layers and layers of paint to kind of create this build up of like magical glowing color so it's one you guys have seen me do I did that with the glow magic piece oh you can look now by the way I the camera has figured itself out and the glow magic piece was done on Magnani 1404 Toscano paper. So a similar watercolor round block with cotton rag paper. And that paper handled it like a champ. This paper, mm, not so much. So now I'm finally starting to do some toning colors. So I've introduced a granulating purple. It's a Daniel Smith granulating purple. It might be Imperial, Imperial purple. It might be Rose of Ultramarine. I don't 100% remember, but I'm introducing it to start introducing some shadow, some drama to this piece, a little bit of grit to imply like she's in a dark room and she's lit by these brilliant stars that she's conjuring from her her hands you know magic and um, I'm just kind of trying to redo what I did in the firefly illustration without working it to death so I'm gonna focus really heavily on the under layers and kind of the toning glaze layers to add some color and add some drama and then I'm gonna very lightly glaze the local color on top of that so for right now I'm really focusing on the background I've added some lunar violet into our ongoing mix and I'm working wet into wet because I a I really want those pigments to granulate out on this paper so we can get some of that drama and B I really want those colors to diffuse so it can really give the impression of glow and lighting unfortunately it doesn't dry nearly as dramatic as it is when it's wet so it's going to take a few layers to build this up so I have now pulled out the contentious supervision, super granulating watercolors. I'm only going to use those in the glow effects and there's gonna be layers painted on top of them. So while I think if I lost some of the color due to light fugitivity, if I were to have this piece displayed, I don't think it would be super noticeable and I don't think it would ruin the piece. That said, this is an illustration that I'm going to keep for myself, but I did scan it and it makes a really cute sticker and I've got some really cute holographic stickers of this illustration. So that's another 
consideration when we're working with these really fugitive art supplies, and honestly, a lot of art supplies are really fugitive, but that doesn't mean they don't have a place in your studio. It just means you gotta know what properties you're working with and what they're gonna do and what you can get out of them. Because if you're creating art so that you can make stickers or you can make stationery or you can put it on a bag, it doesn't necessarily matter that much if the original fades over time. I and mean, it's disappointing, no, no one wants that, but the main point of making the piece and using those materials that gave you such striking effects, because that's why we're using those materials, is for reproduction, not for the final piece. And I'm harping on this a lot. <laughs> I think because part of me feels kind of guilty that I'm recommending something that I know is light fugitive and I have to like caveat it. But I'm also, as I mentioned earlier, a watercolor comic artist and my end use case, while I do sell originals sometimes, my end use case is art for reproduction. I'm not selling my comic pages. I'm selling my comic books, which I guess now's the time to plug it. You guys can check out my comic, 7-Inch Kara. It's a watercolor comic over at 7inchkara.com. Or if you're a fan of the dead tree format, you can purchase volume one and volume two in the Natto shop, or if you're on a budget but you still wanna support my work, you can put in a library request form at your local library and they'll get a hold of the book for you. And that not only helps me, I get to sell a book, it helps you, you get to read the book, and it helps other people because they get to read it too. And that is such a big help and I really appreciate it when people take the time to do that. So as I was nattering on, I did another layer of masking fluid on my stars. I also speckled some in there. And now I'm starting the local color on this piece. So I wanted her hair, I was kind of inspired by how Lum's hair is painted. Um, in that it has like a rainbow effect and then it's got black on top of it so the rainbow is the highlight. I think that's super cute and I kind of wanted to emulate that just a little bit here. I also wanted her to have kind of an interesting hair color and also I wasn't sure what color to, to do her hair. So I started with blue and it's gonna be like a blue black color and then I mixed up her skin tone. So these are techniques you guys have seen me do a few times. So it's one I know I can control and I figured it'd be a fun test for this paper. I'm definitely kind of frustrated though by how messy this looks. This is a reason that I like a somewhat assertive paper texture in my cold press because it gives the granulation somewhere to granulate to so it doesn't just look muddy. This paper is not a friend of granulation. The paints also have a tendency to reactivate and bleed on this paper even after I've allowed them to fully dry, which is frustrating. I mean, if you know the paper is gonna do that and you have a technique where you want it to do that and that does happen, in fact, I have tutorials where I talk about doing that, that's great. But it's one of those things you kinda wanna know about ahead of time, which is one of the reasons why we're doing a field test so we can actually figure out what this paper is capable of, what it'll take. It's like you guys know if you wanna try this paper out, if it's worth your time, if it's worth your money, um, so that you guys can figure out what you can do with this paper. So I don't know about you guys, your experiences might be different. I might've gotten a bad batch. That does happen from time to time. Sometimes one person will have a really bad experience with an art supply and somebody else will have a really great experience with an art supply. And sometimes it just comes down to manufacturing differences or even atmospheric differences. But in this instance, I don't think this is a paper that I can get away with doing like really tight illustrations on. I think this is one better suited to looser illustrations. And it's also one that doesn't really play well well with granulation as you guys can see. So I'm really trying to build up that glow effect now. So I'm kind of not only working with those supervision, super granulating colors that are really bright and fun, but not so, not so safe on the paper. They're kind of fugitive. I'm also going in with some of my regular watercolors and kind of reinforcing some of those colors. And I'm building up several layers of color and masking fluid, color and masking fluid, so that we get more depth to the illustration. The glow effect is gonna have a lot more nuance once we're removing our masking fluid in. More on that later. At this point though, I'm not really doing anything super special or complicated. I did try to keep things pretty simple with this because I really like a good straightforward field test for my papers. I mean, frankly, there are times when I really fall in love with a paper as I'm painting on it and I try to go more complex, but generally when I'm planning these field tests, I keep it kind of simple and I kind of try to move at the same pace as the paper. If the paper seems like it's well suited to more advanced techniques or will really let me do a lot of layering or really get in there and do a lot of fine details, 
or has like a good assertive texture and we can get some cool dry brush going on, then I'm going to kind of up what I'm trying to do. But this paper isn't really up for any of that. So I'm kind of just keeping it simple and trying not to overwork this piece because this paper is not gonna allow for that. This paper is not gonna tolerate that and it could all turn to mud and all fall apart. The only really complicated thing, and I say that in heavy air quotes, is just these layers of masking fluid. And I, as I'm adding these layers, I know I'm rolling the dice. I know there's a good chance that this paper is just going to shred when I remove the masking fluid and I could ruin the whole thing. And there are ways that I know how to kind of fix those mistakes. So it's definitely a thought in the back of my mind, but I'm not going to let it stop me from actually playing around with it and trying it out. So I have the benefit of 2020 hindsight. I know what the finished piece looks like and I also know how I feel about the finished piece. And I also know how I feel watching myself paint this and watching those paints reactivate and look really muddy and dirty. So slight spoiler, I really like the finished illustration. I like it so much I made a holographic sticker out of it. I think it turned out really cute, but it took a couple of days of it living in my portfolio and me not looking at it for me to get over what I'd hoped that I could do with this illustration versus what the paper was going to allow me to do with this illustration. And that's kind of my, my big art advice is that if you don't like a piece, if you're feeling bummed out about an illustration, put it away for a few days and come back to it later. Because often the reason we feel that way is we have it built up in our head that it's going to look a certain way or we're going to be able to do certain things with it. And for various reasons, ranging from skill to having a a bad art day to atmospheric reasons sometimes we're just not able to accomplish exactly what we had in our head and sometimes it's hard to love the piece because it fails to live up to that expectation so putting it away for a little while putting it in a portfolio or a sketchbook and not looking at it kind of gives you a chance to forget what you thought that expectation would be and you can come back to it with fresh eyes and then one of the benefits it's kind of a weird benefit but it's one I really enjoy of recording myself and narrating it is that I get to kind of self critique. So I have the benefit of coming back around and liking the illustration that I did if, if that's in the cards for me. But I also have the benefit of looking at what I did and watching my process and being like, oh, I would do this differently or I would use these materials differently or what have you. Now I'm really happy with how this piece turned out and I'm going in now, I think there's probably a little bit of lunar violet in there, but it's mostly lunar black. And you guys can see I'm starting to fill in around the stars because that's going to give us a more striking transition between the individual layers of stars. It's also going to give us more contrast. So it's going to appear to be more glowy. So this is a cool technique that you can use to also paint things like neon or light sources. Um, just I really like lunar black. And then I lifted it out just a little bit after it had a chance to kind of stain the paper so that we have some variation in the color. It's not all just lunar black. Anyway, um, I actually really like how this piece turned out. I'm not super excited about the paper. I'm going to continue using the block because I don't want to waste the paper in it, but I think I'm going to try doing a lighter hand and maybe do something a little bit more delicate. The next time I use this paper, maybe use it, try some flower illustrations on it or something. But um, this is not really an all, a good all-rounder watercolor paper. It doesn't it's got a lot of flaws and a lot of shortcomings. And while I like the art that I was able to create with it, in fact, I'm adding some more contrast to her dress now. While I like the art that I was able to create with it, I didn't like the hoops that I had to jump through. And I didn't like 
some of the problems. So we talked a lot about removing that masking fluid. We are finally at the point where we're actually gonna do it. And I'm using a masking fluid pickup to help me. It's a tool that I use all the time. And I find that for me, it generally reduces the amount of wear and tear on my paper. So removing the masking fluid, and this is removable masking fluid, by the way, removing the masking fluid does tear up the paper. It's so disappointing because I was hoping for a really cool reveal, and now I have to patch up a bunch of areas that were ruined or chewed up by the masking fluid on this weird cotton rag paper. It's really frustrating to spend so long building up color and painting something only to remove the masking fluid and have it tear up the paper surface and then have to repaint a bunch of stuff. And frankly, that really soured me on it. Now, now I know this is just a paper that I'm not going to use masking fluid on. There's several papers like that. I mean, the Sennelier watercolor paper doesn't really like masking fluid either. Um, different papers are for different artists, for different use cases, for different needs. Not everything, most things are not going to be like 100% perfect, the best thing ever for every artist. There's some good all-rounders out there, but not every art supply can do that. My complaint is that Arteza positions itself in kind of a weird place in the marketplace because a lot of what they're selling really should be more budget art supplies, but their price point is high for budget art supplies. And while they do have somewhat frequent sales, I still feel like in general, the prices are kind of high for the quality that we're getting. And I've reviewed a lot of Arteza stuff here on the channel, and I will probably continue to review Arteza stuff from time to time. I was hopeful about this because I'd reviewed their other expert cotton rag watercolor paper, and it was okay. It was overpriced, but it was a good cotton rag watercolor paper. Um, it cost more than a comparable pad of arches, or, and you can get pads of arches kind of cheap. And it was definitely more than Stonehenge Aqua. So that was kind of my complaint is that it was expensive for what it was, but I was hoping this block would use that paper and it doesn't, it's using something else. This paper might be good for gouache. It might be good for uh, color pencils, but it's not the best fit for what I wanted to do with watercolor today. Could also be great for line and wash. Again, different artists with different needs, with different art styles might find this paper suitable. But if you like masking fluid and you like to do a lot of layers and you want atmospheric granulation, this paper is not gonna do it for you. So you guys can see I'm repainting a lot of the stars. I'm adding color back in. It's, it's, it's fine. Like it's not what I wanted to have to do, but I'm gonna do what I need to do to make this a piece that I like and can be proud of and enjoy. So it's just one of those things. So once the paper had a chance to dry fully, I'm going in with some of my watercolor pencils just to kind of clean up some of the details because this paper turned my granulation to mud. So I wanted to kind of clean things up, add layers of color that I wouldn't have been able to glaze over it because this paper cannot really take a lot of glazing. It, it takes the watercolor pencil decently well. You could probably use watercolor pencil. I like a more assertive texture with more sizing if I'm using watercolor pencils. Um, and I'm not, I use watercolor pencils mainly to add accents or to adjust and shift colors or add details. I don't really like using watercolor pencils as a standalone product myself. That's just personal opinion. So I am not the artist to tell you if this paper is a good fit for watercolor pencils, but if they were useful for helping me adjust some of the things that were just a little bit not what I wanted or not really what I had in mind. Another kind of complaint, and maybe it's the illustration, maybe it's the artist, maybe it's the paper, maybe it's the combination of the three, is that I had to spend a lot of time finessing this piece after I thought it was done. And, you know, that's a choice that I'm making, and it's not necessarily like the death of this paper, but I do think the price point of this paper is kind of the big problem. So I'm going in now and I'm adding some white gouache highlights to her hair and to some of the stars and to her outfit. And I feel like this 
really kind of helps. It adds some levity. It makes it a lot cuter and more cartoony than it was starting to skew. It just helped a lot. There's a lot of things that I like about this illustration. I think it's a cute illustration with a fun theme and it's very lighthearted and I'm all about that. I really love making art that makes other people smile or makes them feel a little bit better about their day. Um, so in that aspect, I feel like it was successful, but I don't really feel like this paper was the best fit for the materials that I used or even really the subject matter that I chose to use. So it'll be interesting to use this paper in the future when making art and see if I can maybe find the best case Ontario, the use case where this paper really shines and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to buy it in bulk because I love it for this one specific thing. I mean, that's what ended up happening with the Maritini watercolor rounds and now I can't find them at all. So talking about going back and adjusting things, things did get a little bit muddy. That sometimes happens with watercolor when you paint on top of inks, especially with more opaque colors. So I'm just going to go back and re-ink it in a few places just to add some clarity and to kind of clean things up. So just as a reminder, this paper is around $20 on Amazon, or rather this block is around $20 on Amazon. You guys have seen me use the Dora Art watercolor pad. That's a cellulose pad, to be fair. It is around the same price, and it has some similar issues, but it it plays so nice with alcohol markers. It's a really fun one for mixed media. So I've got kind of a, a little tender spot in my heart. And then on Amazon, the Magnani paper is $36.15. So this is still a cheaper paper. It might still be a great option for you. I just think considering some of the sizing issues and the fact that the block can't actually hold the paper in place, that those are definitely concerns worth addressing that make it not really the best fit for the price point. Now on the plus side, I was able to remove it super easily with a palette knife because it was already basically halfway to removing itself from the watercolor block. And that's, I'm going to harp on that a lot, mostly because like I love the round watercolor format and it doesn't work the best for reproduction stuff because it's round, but it just, it's such a satisfying format to paint in. And you definitely want to be able to do edge to edge painting with a round block. And you can't really do edge to edge painting if you have to stretch it and secure it. And then you're also going to lose some of that round format. So block bound is really the best, one of the better ways to go if you want to do edge to edge painting with watercolor round paper. So the fact that the block catastrophically fails and failed in the mud test and failed in the field test is just such a yikes for me, especially because the Dora Arts block doesn't fail and the Magnani block doesn't fail. So what is my verdict for this watercolor paper? This is one I might have to revisit with a lighter hand and a lighter subject matter because I think there's some promise, but I think this paper has a lot of limitations that someone who's more experienced with watercolor and would want to try more of like a different variety of watercolor techniques on this paper might find frustrating and limiting. So I am going to, in general, say this one's kind of a pass for me, but I'm going to keep using it in the future from time to time and check in with you guys. And if my opinion changes, I'll definitely let you guys know. The price point is better than a lot of the ones that are on the market, but the fail points are pretty painful. I hope this review was helpful, useful, inspiring, and informative for you guys. And hopefully this will be helpful in you guys making art a habit. If you guys enjoyed hanging out with me today, I'd love it if you hung out with me some more by hitting the subscribe button and clicking that bell notification to let YouTube know that you like what I do. Huge thanks to my amazing art nerds over on Patreon. Their financial support allows me to buy the art supplies that I review here on the channel. I have a line art for you guys so hopefully you guys will check it out have a great day guys